Hello, listeners. Before we start, I just want to mention that if you're looking for a one to one teacher for private lessons online to improve your speaking, your grammar, your vocabulary, your accent, or for specific purposes like exam preparation and job interviews, if you're looking for some one to one lessons, check out British Council English Score Tutors. They have lots of British Council approved teachers to choose from, and it's all online, so you can arrange regular English lessons and conversations. Conversations from the comfort of your own home in just a few clicks. And they are offering you your first lesson for just one dollar so you can see how you like it. And if you do go on to buy a pack of lessons, they'll throw in a free lesson because you're a Lepster. Okay, one dollar trial lesson. Oh, I'll see how this is, see what this is like. No strings attached. You can choose to just leave it at that if you want, or you go on to buy some more lessons. And if you do that, They'll just throw you a little free lesson there as well because you're a Lepster because you listen to this podcast. So to get your trial lesson for just one dollar, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash English to get started. Okay, nice one. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the podcast. I hope you're doing well today. This episode is called Meditation and Learning English. And as the title suggests, this is about the topic of meditation and how it can help us in our lives in various ways, including with our learning of languages. My guest this time is podcaster and English teacher Anthony Rotuno. Anthony is back on the podcast after being on the show a few times last year. If you remember, we did a series of episodes about John Lennon. Uh, so Anthony is back and Anthony has a few podcasts of his own. Actually, you might remember that I recently said that I'd listened to a couple of episodes of one of Anthony's podcast, which were all about meditation and they were called the joys and wonders of meditation. I don't know if you remember me mentioning that in an episode, probably in December or January or something. Anyway, I listened to Anthony's episodes, the joys and wonders of meditation. That was sort of late last year when I listened to them during quite a stressful period when we were having work done on our new flat and it was all getting a bit out of control. And actually, I found that listening to Anthony talking about the subject of meditation and doing a few uh, meditation exercises even during the episode, I, I really felt like they helped me to find ways to keep my stress under control and to get a bit of mental clarity during all of that chaos. And I definitely recommend those episodes to everyone. Uh, that's episodes four and five of Life and Life Only. That's the name of the podcast. Episodes four and five of Life and Life Only. And you'll find links on the page for this episode to both of those episodes. So while listening to Anthony talking about that, I immediately thought I should invite him back onto my podcast for an interview, this time about meditation. And I think there's a lot of stuff to learn from this, a lot of benefits to gain from it all, and some interesting ideas to consider about learning English. So let me just remind you about Anthony, Anthony Rotuno. As I said if, just a moment ago, Anthony was on my podcast a few times last year talking about John Lennon, and he's always an insightful, articulate, and thoughtful guest, so it's nice to have him back. Just a reminder, Anthony is an English teacher like me. He's from England. He is a musician and also a podcaster. He has three podcasts. In fact, you might want to check them out if you're looking for even more stuff to listen to. So there's Life and Life Only, which is the one I've already mentioned. In episodes of Life and Life Only, he explores themes of self-development, philosophy, and the search for inner and outer truth. And this is the one with the episodes about meditation. Uh, his other podcast is called Glass Onion on John Lennon, in which Anthony goes into fascinating depth about many aspects of John Lennon's life and related topics. And then there's Film Gold. This is Anthony's third podcast. Like, How many podcasts do you need? Three, apparently. So the third one is called Film Gold which is basically a chance for Anthony to discuss some of his favorite films with different guests. And uh, in fact, I was a guest in a recent episode of Film Gold. We talked about one of our favorite British comedy films of all time, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. If you want to listen to Anthony and me chatting about that film, then check out Film Gold, episode 15. 
So those are Anthony's podcasts and they're available wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links in the description and on the page for this episode on my website, Life on Life Only, Glass Onion and Film Gold. So there you go. Lots of other things for you to listen to there. But you might be thinking, hold on, Luke, I'm already listening to this. Yeah, I'm not telling you to stop listening to this and then listen to something else. I'm just saying, there you go. There's even more stuff that you can, you know, I don't know, put in your uh, thing. (laughs) <laughs> what put in your ears that's it if you choose to right so anyway if you when you finish this if you're hungry for more you could listen to anthony and me talking about monty python in episode 15 of film gold or anthony's original meditation episodes from life and life only right then but now i've got to stop rambling and get on with this so let's get back to this episode that you're listening to right now and the topic of meditation so meditation What is it exactly? How does it work? How do you actually do it? Is it just the same as relaxation? Does it make you go to sleep? What can the benefits of meditation be? What can Anthony tell us about his experiences of finding out about it and doing it, including going on several silent meditation retreats? What are some simple meditation techniques that you can apply to your daily life? And can meditation help you to be a better learner of English? Those are the talking points. And there are some tangents, of course, as we end up talking about other bits and pieces along the way. And there are also a few quick meditation exercises or spot meditations, which you can do while you listen, if you like. This episode is quite long, but hopefully you'll, you'll agree that it's all worth listening to. Now, in, in order to give you an idea of what that means, I mean the spot meditations, to give you an idea of what a spot meditation is, let's do a very quick spot meditation exercise right now, just before the interview starts, to help you focus. Now, I'm making this one up myself. Uh, of course, because I'm, I'm not a meditation instructor, but I'm willing to give it a shot. So here is my attempt at a quick uh, sort of mini guided meditation before you listen to my conversation with Anthony to help you focus. That's the idea. So just follow my instructions for a moment and it might put you in the, f- in the right frame of mind to really concentrate on our conversation and also maybe to give you an idea of what is involved in some of the more simple daily meditation exercises that you can do in your everyday life. So here we go. Are you ready? Are you listening? Are you sitting comfortably? You may, maybe you're standing, I don't know. But the first thing I'd like you to do is just consider your body position while you are listening to this. Just take a moment to be aware of your body and any feelings of tension that you might have anywhere in your body. You feel a bit tight or tense anywhere. Are your shoulders tense? Are you sitting upright or are you perhaps slumped in some way? Are you kind of tied up in a knot? Are you standing unevenly on one leg or leaning to one side? Is your jaw clenched? Just take a moment to find those tensions in your body and slowly release them. Just let them relax. Take a few deep breaths from your diaphragm and feel the sensation of the air going in and coming out and your stomach going up and down. Now focus on my voice. Focus on the shape of the words the different kinds of sounds that are included in each syllable of each word. Notice the rhythm of the sentences I'm saying, where the stresses are, where the pauses are, and any times my voice goes up or down. And just try to follow it very carefully without letting your mind get distracted by other things. If you feel your mind wandering off, if you get distracted, or if you feel like saying, come on, Luke, stop rambling. We don't want another 15 minute introduction. Just get on with it, please. Or something. If you do feel your mind wandering at all, then just guide it gently back as you listen to this conversation between Anthony and me. Um, okay. So you can just keep going with that approach. There you are. So that was just a very brief spot meditation. Um, couldn't help making it a bit ridiculous. Anyway, Maybe that will help you focus your attention a bit. Okay, so now let's start the episode properly. And here we go. This is Meditation and Learning English with Anthony Rotuno. I'll speak to you again, oh, in about 90 minutes time, I think, (laughs) briefly. I'll just speak to you again briefly at the end of this, but I hope you enjoy the conversation. And here we go. Welcome back onto the podcast. Thanks. For the, I don't know how many, this is like the fourth time, I think. Yeah, it's the second time we've, well, third time we've recorded, but we did a four-parter, and uh, 
let me just say it's lovely to just talk about something other than John Lennon and the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> it really, especially after Get Back, <laughs> there's nothing else to say. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. guess doing a podcast about John Lennon, you end up talking about that quite a lot. Yeah, it's good to be talking about a totally different topic today. I wonder if the Beatles will come up. <laughs> they probably will. <laughs> yeah, very early, in fact. Yes. Yeah. So around a year ago, I think it was, uh, you recorded several episodes of your podcast, uh, which were called The Joys and Wonders of Meditation, uh, episodes four and five of Life and Life Only. And I listened to them a few months ago, and I thought they were great. And so, uh, yeah, I thought I'd invite you on to talk about that subject. I think it's a really good subject. Um, so what inspired you to record that double episode about meditation then? Well, yes, I started Life and Life Only about uh, a year ago. Yeah, it was January last year. And um, in a nutshell, I was trying to find a theme for the podcast, and I found this theme of inner and outer truth. So it has two very separate strands. The outer is to do with um, dealing with uh, life itself and uh, this strange information landscape we're in. And then the inner part is about to deal with that, one of the best ways is to become uh, what you might call armor-plated, so in terms of your inner self-development. And um, one of the reasons I call it the joys and wonders of meditation, I think I made a reference, because I listened to a little bit, little bit of it last night um, to refresh myself, and we always talk about wonder drugs, which obviously are essentially pharmaceuticals. And our society is very much built on, here's a pill for this, and it's never, of course, treating the cause. It's always treating the symptoms. So um, I, I describe meditation as a meditation and yoga, in fact, as almost wonder, the equivalent of a wonder drug. Um, in that, it's just so helpful. It really is. And I'm not. I, I want to say right off the bat. I said this on my podcast. Um, I don't practice everything that's in this book, but I know I should. <laughs> I know if, if everybody meditated and did yoga every day, the world would be a different place. <laughs> so really just, um, yeah, I just wanted to get, and I wanted that to be one of the early episodes because it's meditation is such a good launch point for, for everything else. It's the kind of thing like you do it in the morning, it sets you up for the day. So it just felt right to have it as a very early episode. Yes, indeed. Mm. Very good idea. Um, the book, you said you mentioned a book. Uh, you said you don't practice absolutely everything in this book. Um, and you're talking about a book called Teach Yourself to Meditate by Eric Harrison, uh, which you talked about in the episode and you read some passages from. And um, I actually got it for Christmas um, after you recommended it in your episode. And yes, it is a great book. We'll come on to talk about that book and maybe read out some, some pages from it too, just like you did in your episode um, in a, in a little bit, in, you know, later on in this episode. I think mm -hmm. we should probably uh, define meditation at the beginning and just make sure that people really know what we're talking about. And also another thing that comes to mind at this point is the fact that my listeners, my audience are, are all around the world. And we are obviously talking from a sort of, let's say, Western perspective, you know, being both of us, are, you know, are English. The, mm -hmm. the, um, the book was written by an Australian guy. Uh, but yeah, it's sort of like that Western way of looking at things. So maybe some of my listeners are already like fully familiar with a lot of these ideas and concepts and they are not sort of new ideas or even sort of revolutionary ideas or different ways of looking at things. For them, it might just be like, oh yeah, that's just totally normal. That's like the way we do things. So mm. Yeah, that might be something to consider. So, I don't know, listeners, you can let us know. I mean, do, is, is this all um, very familiar to you already or, or what? You know, we are talking from our sort of Western perspective here. Um, but um, so what is meditation and what isn't meditation? Okay, so, I mean, I don't have a, de a definition to hand, but it, I think it's better sometimes just to think of your own what it means to you but uh, i think one of the misconceptions is that one of the say dictionary definitions of meditation is to do with thinking so uh, you might say something like i meditated on this decision which means you you thought about it very deeply so that's the first misconception uh, it's not thinking in fact it's really the opposite it's about clearing the mind i suppose uh, i suppose sometimes you find yourself reflecting on things 
uh, which might link it a little bit to thinking. But essentially, meditation, there's different forms. The one I do is to do with breath, uh, sometimes called mindfulness meditation. And essentially, it, you're just focusing on one object, either an external object or the object, in inverted commas, could be the breath. You're focusing on something. And it, when thoughts come in, as they inevitably do, you accept the thought and then you just try to let the thought leave your mind and you're just clearing a space for clarity to come in basically now the technique of that again heavily stereotyped i'm sure we'll talk about this won't we you know the the someone in a saffron robe in the lotus position it's been horribly stereotyped and i'll give you my uh what i think might be the reason for that <laughs> my conspiratorial yeah. reason <laughs> um so the technique here is really just um Normally, to be in a quiet space, particularly for beginners, you're going to need to be in a quiet space and probably shut your eyes. And, yeah, it's, a, it's about filtering out thoughts and all the things that cloud what is, uh, quote-unquote, the truth. You know, so it's a, it's a relaxation thing, but it also has a deeper sense of a kind of a self-realisation as well. Yeah, so, because, uh, I mean, yeah. you, you said right at the beginning that... Um you know, in the world that we live in, we are constantly being bombarded with information and we're constantly being sort of manipulated by information in various ways, whether it's just advertising or, 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 or whatever, you know, whatever, all the media that we're exposed to, all the noise that there is. And so, yeah, meditation is a way of getting rid of all of those things. But also our own minds are bombarding us with things. Like, if, you know, sometimes you're just being bombarded by worries or concerns or guilt or you're reflecting and remembering on things that have happened and worrying you know worrying about this that and the other and you know all these things come flying in and even even not thoughts that are as clear as that sometimes it's just music that you can't stop running around in your head if you've got an, an earworm you know just that sort of noise that's constantly going on inside your brain so meditation is a way of getting that out of there how is it different to relaxation because, you know, people talk about relaxation and, and the sort of thing that maybe people do to help them fall asleep. Is meditation like falling asleep? Should you fall asleep when you're doing it? Yeah, the difference is with relaxation. Often people will relax with something. Um, it could be a book. People often say, oh, you know, I relax in front of the telly. But if, uh, if we take the example of the telly or a book, in fact, you are more of a passive consumer of whatever you're consuming to help you relax particularly if it's television because it's visual and you know it's a very very passive activity generally um you can use it to go to sleep i think i have done that because there are guided meditations i mean there's hundreds and thousands probably online that are free anyone can anyone could look at and um you can use it in that way but Meditation is not really designed for you to fall asleep uh, because then that, that becomes kind of a different thing. That is relaxation, as you said. So perhaps one of the differences when you meditate, you are perhaps trying to be... Generally, you want to be in a more dynamic posture. So you want to, you want to feel energised when you meditate. But definitely you can use it as a kind of a cheat almost. Not really a cheat, but as a technique for going to sleep. Yes, it can work in that way. But I don't think it's generally designed for that. It's, I suppose it might depend whether you do it during, um, in the morning or in the evening. You know, One thing you could do is do a more dynamic meditation in the morning to set you up for the day and then a more relaxed one in the evening. So it, it, definitely, has a, it definitely relaxes you. But in the book he talks about it's a sort of balance between feeling relaxed and feeling calm but also feeling quite dynamic at the same time. So it's more of an active thing. It shouldn't be too passive, I think. Yeah. Does it involve some work? Can it be hard work? Yeah, I think it depends what results you want to get. I mean, it's um, it's like anything. I mean, we're, we're language teachers. And it's like, I mean, language learning can be fun or it can be work. And it's a struggle to become very good at it. And meditation, it's not that there are levels. Like, you know, you, you don't go like B1, B2, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But obviously, like anything, you get better at it and you get more results. So one of the things in the book that I loved is that he said, you know, in a half an hour meditation, the first time you do it, if you get 20 seconds of, of shutting out the noise, you're doing well. 
But I think really any meditation you do is of benefit. But like anything, it depends whether you're looking for a specific result or how much you want to push yourself. But uh, yes, it, it is hard work, but it should be enjoyable at the same time so exactly like language learning really. yeah just like learning english yes <laughs> yeah exactly yeah that was what you know what you put into it is kind of what you get out of it ultimately mm. similar thing uh, if i could just say one more thing actually uh, he, he said this again the other thing is whether you do it alone or in a group and if you do it in a group um you will find this wonderful group energy and i'll get onto this when i talk about the retreats later on but yeah then it becomes it's, it's still work within yourself but it's like you've got the collective energy of a group of however many it is 10 20 people so it's definitely more difficult on your own mm-hmm. um but you know you could still do it on your own it's fine yeah okay mm. so what level are you i mean you said there are no levels you know there's it's not b1 b2 and then you know <laughs> c1 i else there's no i else for meditation or anything yeah. uh, but <laughs> where are you as a med as a meditator then yeah well when i when i said at the beginning that I, I don't do everything in that book that that's not because i think that not because i think any of it is not valid it's purely to do with discipline um so through different stages in my life i've been more diligent and i've reached a level there there is a level you reach and uh like you said there's no exam for this but there's a level you reach where when you when you can concentrate for a certain amount of time mental images arise and, and these are kind of the magic moments and you get like moments of clarity. And, um, in fact, let me, let me give you an example. This is more like the miracle side of meditation almost. And my dad, I asked my dad if, if he, if I was okay mentioning this and he said, yes. So, so my dad had a, a tough childhood and he had a very domineering father in Italy. And, uh, that's all I'll say about that. But, uh, I, I got my dad into meditation through this book about five years ago and my dad i'd be trying to get my parents into it because my parents like many people in their 60s or 70s they believe that you can't change i mean people who are like 35 believe that they can't change which is absolute rubbish so i thought i've got to do this very very gently and um so i I, um i photocopied a few of the spot meditations said oh why don't you try this Anyway, I sort of said to my dad, I'd really like to read this book. And my dad read it as a book. And he came back to me and said, oh, yeah, this book's great. And I said, well, have you done any meditations? He goes, oh, no, I'm getting to that. But I love this book. It's fantastic. And he actually read it twice before he started meditating. Okay. But then he, then, he, then he started meditating. And um, one of the things was uh, he immediately forgave his father. He says, he says, absolutely incredible. He did about 10 sessions and he was a beginner, basically. Yeah. But through concentrating and just through feeling clarity, he got this, I don't know, I wouldn't say he got a message, because it's not coming from someone else. That's the point. It's within him. Yeah. He's like, oh, I've, I, I forgive my father. I, I understand. Yeah, he, he was trying to do his best. And even though it came out horribly, um, I forgive yeah. him. So, yeah. Uh, but I was coming to my sorry, I was coming to my point. Yeah, you get you get these um, at a certain level. You might get these visions. And when I did the when I did the uh, retreat on about day seven of the ten days, I actually experienced this incredible thing where I I saw myself. I thought I was dreaming, in fact, but I was definitely awake. I saw a, a mental image of myself sitting there uh, meditating. This is during a meditation. Yeah, during a meditation, yeah, yeah. in um, this meditation retreat. Yes. Um, and it was, yeah, it was amazing. And I don't know if there was, there wasn't any necessary message to it, but just, just seeing yourself, just seeing an image of yourself is an incredible thing because the only time you ever see that is when you look in the mirror and most people don't want to spend too long looking at themselves in the mirror. <laughs> but it's just seeing yourself from the outside. And, uh, and I can't remember what thought came to me at that time, but it, it was some sort of message or some you know, some message of clarity. And invariably, when I do uh, reach a certain level of concentration, I always go back to my childhood, like, because we left this town when I was about eight eight or nine years old. So I've got a very rose-tinted idea of this town. I'm sure it wasn't as great as I think it was. But uh, I just I just seem to be happier then, mostly because we had relatives around. So I think when you get to a certain level, 
when you've cleared the noise, as you said, like um, either metaphorically or actually, what you get is you get these sort of, if I say visions, it's going to scare people off, isn't it? But <laughs> you get images and they seem to provide a certain clarity for you. And um, I don't know, I, I, I feel like I know it when it comes and I know I'm getting a, a message of clarity and I need to sort of take notice of it or take it seriously. Yeah. So um, that's a roundabout way of saying, um, if really my meditation is like my Spanish, because uh, <laughs> I used to live in Spain, and I, but now I don't. It's sort of falling away badly. But uh, You've got to practice it. I'm, I'm, I'm undisciplined, but uh, uh, it doesn't take me too long to, to get back to a state where I can concentrate quite well for about even just five minutes. And it yields results. It's very interesting, yeah. though, what you said about that, just sort of moments of clarity. And it does make total mm. sense, just listening to you talk about it, that if mm. meditation is about clearing away um, noise or clearing away sort of uh, layers of things, you know, things that have, I don't know, over time we maybe cover things up in terms of our memories. We put barriers mm. in, barriers come in to protect us from you know uh, our concerns or traumatic memories or things that made us sad or things that were troubling we sort of block them out so it's about removing all those blocks and yeah so maybe that's when things hit you like the sort of the truth or you see things for how they really are it sounds it it yeah it sounds like it could be a bit disturbing i mean it, what did you take from that moment when you kind of saw yourself was it sort of a a refreshing feeling or was it a, uh, how did you feel about it was it well, was it nice um uh, i think it was nice yes but i think I, i'm a kind of person who feels like uh i don't mind going through a pain barrier to reach to reach something at the other end of it so uh it yeah it can be painful and the funny thing is with uh, the podcast life and life only like i said i've managed to connect these inner and outer strands because i also have research like really dark topics about the truth about how the world works and it's absolutely horrible you know it really is and i don't advise everyone to do it you're talking about things like uh, propaganda and, and and so on right yeah and things like what the real history of things are you know and 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 war i mean it tends to be dominated by war yeah. so really the strand is that you could find the same thing in yourself you know i i've i've been to some Dark. Not that I've not that I think I've done anything really terrible in my life, but you know, sometimes you treat people badly, and yeah, you yeah. look at the sort of dark darker sides. And it's a guy called Robert Green who's done some incredible books, and I've read all of them, and they're all they're all absolute tomes. And the last one he did was the last but one I think was called The Laws of Human Nature, and he went through that. And he talked about um, uh, the Jungian idea of the shadow. What's that? Of, uh, the, the our dark side basically okay so you know you might talk about or oh, everyone's got a, sort of an angel and a devil you know you've got your your higher self your nicer person and then you've got that dark side that has dark thoughts that you never tell anyone basically <laughs> and uh, so um I, i've never been afraid to go to go there yeah because there is a dark side to everyone you know even the nicest person in the world i think has got a dark side yeah uh, yeah 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 so to answer the question it's not always nice. When I saw myself and that thing, I, I honestly can't remember what thought came into my head, but it was, I think one of the things, one of the things I do remember is that, oh, <laughs> this is very personal, but hey, who cares? Um, Some times when I've meditated, I said, I think about my childhood and I occasionally get, I get a picture of myself as a, as an eight or nine year old. Yeah. And cause I feel like I've messed up so much in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I've wasted I wasted so much time and I wasted my talents. That's the way I feel anyway. I'm yeah. kind of clawing it back now by putting podcasts out at a furious rate. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I I was in tears a couple of times because I wanted to talk to that boy and, and say, Oh no, don't do this, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So it can be very, very emotional and if you think that's a nice thing, then it's nice. But if you think that's a painful thing that you'd rather avoid, then it's not nice. <laughs> Eric Harrison in the book does talk about this sort of thing that when you're clearing uh, all those thoughts and and repressed memories and things like that mm. it can be quite a painful process but it's a bit like detoxing you know like yes. the way physically we detox and that could be quite rough but the end result is is worth it 
I think certain people, again, I, I credit, <laughs> I was going to come to this later, but John Lennon was such a huge influence on my life. And we'll get to that in a sec, I guess, yeah. with meditation. But, uh, <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yeah. One of, the, one of the things that was really good about him, you know, if you believe, who knows, who knows what the truth is, but yeah. he wasn't afraid to do that. So I was heavily influenced by people like him who, who were desperate to explore themselves, you know, because he would do this thing where he'd look at his face in the mirror for so long that his face would start to distort yeah. and uh not surprisingly i tried that as well and your <laughs> face does start to distort and it's very strange but it's almost like he was he was um trying to have psychedelic visions when he was about five years old yeah this is something that that he did as a child that he would actually have similar experiences but without the aid of any psychedelic drugs that even as a child he would stare at himself in the mirror until his face started to uh, kind of change shape and it's just a you know an attempt to i guess to know to get to know himself properly to learn who he really is and you know because he had a difficult childhood and he'd been taken away from himself by certain traumas or complicated emotional relationships and things like that so Mm. yes yes um okay simple meditation techniques Mm. So if we kind of bring it back to that again and um, talk about any specific uh, techniques that you can can mention. Now, we will go into, I don't know how long this episode will be. It might end mm-hmm. up being two episodes like yours. Uh, we'll mm. go into some more specifics and we'll actually read fr- a couple of pages from Eric Harrison's book, which will maybe explain some other uh, little meditation exercises that people can do. Uh, but um, what are some simple meditation techniques that you can apply to your daily life obviously you can do meditations of of the kind that uh, are more what you would traditionally think of so you know sitting quietly attaining a good posture and focusing on your breath but these are just some other things you can do eric harrison mentions uh uh, stroking a cat (laughs) and uh i don't know if this is my phrase or i got it from somewhere but cats are therapy wrapped in fur and uh, there's a kind of a joke that stroking a cat for 10 minutes is about is like having three months of psychotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but really, uh, stroking a cat's an example, or, or washing up is another example, or, or doing, doing housework. It, just what you can do is just try and do everything just a little bit slower. So let's say, you know, you've got, you've got a couple of hours free, or whatever, you've got a day off from work or something. When someone has got a day off, they will probably still find they're doing all their tasks too quickly. Like, oh, I've got to wash up, so I've got to get that out of the way as quickly as possible, then I can get on with something else. So there's always that. One of the meditation classes I came to said, it, when you're washing up, imagine that you're crafting <laughs> or sculpting something. So this will, I know this sounds a bit silly, but um, almost like caressing the plates, and, but just turning it, into, turning it into a pleasurable, more sensual thing. And like I said, striking a cat is such a wonderful thing because cats have this sort of aura of calm and peace and zen and everything. Um, so that's one thing. So washing up and doing tasks and, and making them more pleasurable by just doing it that little bit slower. And um, a very, very simple one, which I, I use every time I kind of have a slight sort of OCD thing that kicks in and I start to sort of tie myself in mental knots is just to sit just for 30 seconds with a good posture and say, let on the inhale and then go on the exhale. So just let go. And you breathe from the diaphragm, from the stomach. And I just find if I just do that five times, I immediately feel a lot calmer. And then uh, one of my favourite ones is a sounds meditation. So you know that when somebody is blind... We know that they their hearing tends to to be better, mm. and that could be to do with compensation, or it could be because they've cleared the visual space. You know, so it could be if you shut your eyes and pretended you were blind, you might find your hearing got better, just because you've opened, you've cleared one channel almost. Yeah, and for the hearing. So anyway, um, this is a good one to do on say uh, metro you now or or any train really. When I was uh, living in Madrid. I used to uh, go on the metro and this worked really well when I was on my way home from work as well and I was in that tired state where I just just really wanted to relax so I would I would just shut my eyes try and sit with a good posture and all you, all you have to do is just tune in to every sound that's around you 
Mm -hmm. So you'll invariably you'll have a conversation going on on your left, conversation going on your right. Because I was in a foreign country, it works well because I didn't understand everything they were saying. Yes. So that immediately you get you, you can tune in more to the rhythm of the language, which is very easy to do when it's a foreign language without getting sort of uh, carried away by the subject matter of what they're saying, which you then react to and you start to have an opinion about. Instead, you're just listening to the rhythm and the sound and the texture of the the sort of oral texture of the the language. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and. So you hear, as the metro is coming into a station, suddenly you hear like, bing, 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 proxima estación, and they'll say the next station. Yeah. Then you'll hear this sort of shh sound as the doors open. You'll hear the engine or the, the motor slowing down. Then there'll be a little bit of a pause. You'll hear people coming on. And when you've actually shut your eyes for 10 or 20 minutes, it's absolutely magical. The sounds are so different to what, what they are when you've got the visual sense. And it's just great. And they, they just, everything just seems so much sharper. And I think that's why people listen to music and things like that and meditations uh, with headphones and often in the dark, you know, when they're in bed or whatever, because you cut off the visual channel. Because I think the visual channel is very overrated. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we need it, but it, it's, it's a huge distraction, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's because I love the oral channel. You know, I grew up with the radio almost as much as TV, and that's interesting that i've become a podcaster of course yeah so it's tuning in and and you just when you cut off one channel that's blocking you a little bit you tune into this to the sound channel and everything gets sharper so that's a few things that that literally could just take five or ten minutes you know very easy to do yeah there's different sort of degrees of this there are these sort of simple little things that you can do in your everyday life and then there are more complex more advanced types of meditation longer ones that uh, that are possible so okay really cool uh, should we talk about meditation and, and learning english i mean since this is a learning mm. english podcast we should probably try and uh, bring learning english into it what do sure. you think do you think that meditation can help with learning a language yeah i was thinking about this i think just um to start with just generally uh, meditation can help with everything so uh, by extension then it would help with learning a language mm. um, because when your mind is clear and uh, I think I think learning languages is is much easier because it's a it's a very tough thing <laughs> you know uh, I learned a bit of Thai I've got okay Italian and I've got fairly okay Spanish but it's a struggle and uh, some people find it a lot easier than others so I think um, maybe being able to focus on, if you're trying to learn vocabulary, one of the things I learned from uh, Darren Brown, in fact, because yeah. I got one, uh, I got his book, and he was talking about um, when you, if you're trying to learn 10 words or something, get, get the mental image that's attached to it, you know, or try, try to put the words together. And I think meditation would help with that because you'll be able to, to really get that sharp image in your head. Yes. So that would be one thing. Yeah. What do you think? I was thinking about this too, of course. And uh, I mean, if meditation is about clearing away distractions and clearing away sort of what, what's called, I think in language learning, it's called the affective filter, which are in language learning, these are things which block you and prevent you from, from learning or acquiring language properly. And it could be just things like stress or social awkwardness, um, social anxieties um, you know like for example if you are trying to learn a language if you're trying to speak in my case French if I'm in a situation where I feel like I'm being judged or I feel like there's a lot at stake you know if it's a high pressure situation my French just completely collapses and that's yeah. not a good environment in which to develop my French you know it's just I just feel bad and I end up in a negative cycle and what happens is I just you know stop I just stop talking. Mm. I just sort of disappear. So in those conditions, you know, a lot of that is just mental factors. Uh, it's kind of either external things sort of telling you that you're not good enough or it's yourself for some reason telling yourself you're not good enough. All these things that basically block you and get in the way. Um, and uh, meditation can train you, as far as I understand, to kind of clear away a lot of those things, get that stuff out of the way, and then, you, you know, it's just you and the language, and you can do it without being blocked. So mm. maybe it can help you 
sort of get rid of those stresses. And, you know, meditation can help you focus and your attention, right? Um, a lot mm. of it is about being focused and not being distracted, not letting the mind wander away, allowing you to not react against things like your your uh, responses to things. Um, and so, for example, practicing another language, as you said, can be a challenge and it can be mm. awkward. And there's a feeling of a lack of control when you're trying to speak mm. another language. There can be a, a tendency to try and escape those feelings. And I think that's what often leads people to fail in their language learning because they sort of run mm. away from it in a way because it just feels too uncomfortable and uh, and so on. But meditation, I think, can help control those impulses to sort of escape and it allows you to continue even if it's difficult. You know, there's it's mental discipline. I think mm. a certain amount of discipline is really important to help you persevere. And, you know, like the, um, the deferred pleasure principle, mm. Eric Harrison mentions that in his book, the deferred pleasure principle, which is about if you're meditating, there's sometimes a tendency for you to suddenly you want to think about something else. Like you want to think about what you're going to cook for dinner or you want to, Mm. your mind goes to something else. Or if you're trying to work, you end up going on Facebook or something because you just get drawn to it because it's an instant sort of um, desire. Gratification. Exactly. Instant gratification. Uh, But meditation is all about deferring those um, impulses for instant gratification and sort of maintaining focus because the the results at the end are worth it uh, as you said before so i think you know basically meditation can help you train your mind to be a more effective language learning machine i don't know if machine is the right <laughs> word um well some, something coming to my head actually uh, just while you were talking based on what i just said about the metro thing about tuning into sounds yeah now i my spanish teacher used to tell me that um sometimes it's worth listening to full speed spanish uh, and even if you don't understand it, the the words will still be going into your head in a kind of way, but also to getting used to the rhythm of the language yes. as well. And I'm wondering whether um, someone could meditate and, and have some headphones on and be in that kind of tuned in state and then maybe just listen to a text if they're English learners, which I guess they are listen to a text and just try to maybe be able to tune into the rhythm of the language you might get to like it a bit more yeah yeah because that's one of one of the things i was lucky in a way because i I love spanish i love the sound of spanish and and even french as well i mean i was good at french when i was at school and most of my students now are happen to be french just because the company I, i work for and it's it's amazing. Uh, with the lower levels, I do translate a little bit, mm-hmm. and I, I'm suddenly like there's French words that were in my head uh, from 30 years ago from school. It's amazing, but uh, yeah, I think meditating, meditating, and trying to tune into the rhythm of a language might help, even when you're not focusing on individual words. Yeah, that, that could be a separate exercise. Yeah, know? I mean, there are theories in language learning, language acquisition. I think Stephen Krashen, you know, is a name that's often mentioned, but I think this is what he has said is that everyone basically is capable, everyone's got the capability to learn and speak other languages um, really well and fluently. And often the thing that stops us, and this is probably true for pronunciation and fluency, some of the things that stop us are internal things that we basically stop ourselves. There are social factors, psychological factors, which basically come in. Like, you know, um, like I've got... French students who I think this is true for but I think it's true for everyone that okay I'll take me as an example I think I could I can probably do an impression of a French person if I really push myself I can do quite a convincing I could do quite a convincing French accent but then Mm. when I do speak French I don't do that because there's this identity issue that comes in which is where I feel strange about Mm. speaking French with a maybe a more natural French accent because it feels a bit embarrassing. Like, um, it's not me. Yeah. And, and, um, so maybe sort of, as we've said, like meditation can help sort of relieve you of those anxieties or those hangups in a sense. I was trying to to think actually, does meditation make you more confident? And I was wondering, I'm not, like if you meditate a lot, 
I was trying to think, does, when you go out and you socialise, you, do you feel more confident? I'm not talking about a language, I'm just saying with anybody. Yeah. And I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if it does or not. I think it just relaxes you. And if, if you feel more confident when you're relaxed, then you'll be more confident, I suppose. But And maybe if you really know yourself and you've sort of come to terms with who you are, mm. then, you know, maybe you can get rid of some of those anxieties that are related mm. to, I don't know what really. I don't know. We're just speculating at the moment, aren't we? Yeah, um, yeah. But going back to pronunciation, this is something I, you know, I've kind of had the same thought as you, basically, which is that sort of when you're doing pronunciation work, this is just some advice, I guess. Uh, focus your mind on the sensations of the words because mm. meditation, as you said before, is about having an, uh, an object and focusing on the object. Either it's a um, a mental object or sometimes it can be music or it can be a physical object that you look at but there's some sort of object and you focus all your attention on that uh, mm. at the expense of everything else it's a way of pushing else pushing everything else out and so if you're doing pronunciation work you can kind of focus your mind on the sensations of the words that you're listening to mm. or that you're trying to pronounce like how they really sound rather than your preconceptions about them based on things like their spelling like a lot of, lot of uh, people mispronounce words because they are so influenced by the spelling of those words. Hmm. You know, you think of ed endings. You know, people are sort of saying, you know, um, I walk head down the street. Exactly, <laughs> perfect example. I walk head down the street, and of course, you're going to think it's walk head because it's ed at the end, but it's yeah. walked down yeah. the street. So yeah, you can kind of focus on. Uh, the words as they really sound rather than your mm. preconceptions of how those words are pronounced based on your visual, um, you know, the visual imprint that you have of that word. And focus, you can focus maybe on the ways that your mouth or body are used to pronounce sounds. Mm. Uh, pronunciation work is, is, is particularly fraught with distractions, stress, embarrassment and identity issues. And maybe mm. it can help to clear these things away and just focus on the task at hand. I think also focusing on the energy of, of um, words and sounds, because going back to that thing about the metro, um, when I shut my eyes, the, these sounds had a particular energy and they were very... Like, suddenly I found the sound of the engine like, or the sound of a, of a train like going... Ch -ch 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 -ch. When you tune into it, it can suddenly sound soothing and calming. So I think perhaps if you were in a meditative state, um, again, going back to Spanish, like certain words would have a particular energy mm. and you, you might find that you like, you, you might find you could tune into that a bit more. And just to give you an example, I'm sure you use a lot of TED Talks or you have done. Yeah, and I do as well. Yeah. And there was one about a uh, woman talking about how memories are unreliable. And she said um, people who'd witnessed they showed them a video of a car of a car crash or something and they said what speed did the uh, one car hit another car and then they asked another group at what speed did the car smash into the other car and smash has a has an energy you know has a sort of destructive energy about it yeah. that word and that, that's the, that's a sort of negative example but other words you can really get to like words uh, one of my favorite words in english is mellifluous mm -hmm. uh, it's just just such a lovely word and Malif <laughs> mellifluous how do you say mellifluous mellifluous, mellifluous. yeah what, is, what does right. mellifluous mean we've got to explain it now yeah mellifluous is like smooth and flowing so and just, just that word and mellifluous it's lovely you know it, it sounds smooth and flowing it sounds exactly like the meaning that it has which is smooth yeah. and like nice and musical to hear Mellif mellifluous a yeah. mellifluous voice, like someone might have a mellifluous voice, for example. Um, mm. Yeah, so um, if meditation can help you enjoy the form of things and appreciate the form of things without being distracted or put off by sort of um, the value judgments about them, then that surely yeah. can help. And I think that, you know, again, in language learning, there are cultural and psychological factors that block people. For example, mm. just what is your relationship with the language that you're learning? And if, if, you are, if that language carries a lot of baggage with it, for example, if you just maybe, maybe you, the, the people that you've met 
that spoke that language you just didn't like them or you had some bad experience with them they weren't very nice people for you you're going to then that language is going to carry all that baggage of those people and those bad experiences that you had or maybe if the language for you represents certain types of tv show or certain types of music that you don't like you know that you that's going to carry all that baggage with you but if you can strip all that away and just enjoy the sound and the feeling of those those words and that language without all of those uh, cultural associations that can maybe give you a better chance to kind of own the language yourself and find your own connection to it yeah i, I meditate on words um even in english because uh i'm sure you'd agree with this uh, even though we're english teachers you could say our english is always improving you know because uh, like i said a word like i don't know mellifluous let's say yeah. uh, i might have known that word before but i might not have known what it meant and i might not have been able to explain it to somebody you know so yeah. i feel like what are the advantages of i think for my teaching is that i feel like i'm open to learning you know, and if a student has a better explanation than me, you know, it shouldn't happen too often because then that would be a bit worrying for students continually being better than you. But every now and again, you know, <laughs> yeah. I think, oh, oh, great, you know. But uh, one of the things, because uh, I'm constantly uh, self-coaching, I call it, you know, like life coaching. Mm-hmm. I'm constantly working on myself. And you can meditate on very positive words. That's a really good exercise. Things like energy. So if you feel, if you're not feeling very energetic mentally or physically, Sometimes I, I I get in a meditative state and I, I repeat the word energy or words like, I don't know, calm or graceful or, or things like that. Yeah. And you can really tune in to the positive energy of certain words. And this is not necessarily in a foreign language, but you can do it in a foreign language because it might help you yeah, have a warmer feeling about the language, as you said. Yeah. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can do. And a lot of the things we've just thought up while we've been talking, which is good. Yeah. Or I have anyway. <laughs> it's it's fascinating. It's fascinating that words do carry, as you say, an energy, or they carry a spirit with them. Um, spirit, yeah. Do you remember? I now you told me that you listened to one of my podcast episodes once upon a time, uh, the one about Muhammad Ali and the Rumble in the Jungle. Muhammad Ali, oh, yes. obviously the boxer, and it was the episode is about a famous fight, a uh, boxing match he had against George Foreman back yes. in 1974. And I, uh, there's a book, a really great book um, called The Fight by Norman Mailer. Okay, this is a bit of a tangent, but it does connect. Go for it. So <laughs> in The Fight, which is an incredible fight, incredible story, one of the things that Muhammad Ali was doing during the fight was not only, you know, punching and blocking uh, and all that stuff, not only the physical stuff, but j- throughout the fight, he was speaking to George Foreman and yes. saying, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're weak. Is that the best you can do? Come on, you're not, you don't punch, you just push. You're not punching, yeah. you're pushing. Is that, come on, give it to me. I'm your, you've met your match. You've met your match. I'm your master. And Norman Mailer sort of talks about this thing that, that apparently there's some tribe in, uh, I think it was Zaire, and they talk about mm. how, words have a spirit and the spirit actually lives in the in the um the spittle which comes out of your mouth when you say them in a lot of the way actors on stage uh like shakespearean or thespian actors when they are you know uh performing on stage sometimes you see like bits of spit coming out of their mouths so when someone is really passionately speaking bits of spittle come out and even when someone's speaking uh in a, in a normal way, you know, mm. uh, bits of, what do you call it, spittle? Um, uh, I don't know. Anyways, bits of <laughs> spit, saliva, sounds, saliva spit, uh, <laughs> stuff comes out of your mouth. This is why we wear masks and stuff, you know, to prevent uh, viruses being spread. Um, yeah. But the, according to the, 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 this idea, this African, I, don't, I don't, can't say which African tribe it is, but anyway, they say that there is, a, there is a spirit, that words have a spirit and it exists in the spittle and it comes out of your, you know, when it comes out of your mouth, it's like an actual spirit. Uh, mm. in, a, in, a, in a sort of um, in a physical form and so yeah words apparently have some sort of energy they have a spirit to them mm. and saying them i mean you know again another thing is language in the many many years ago was was related to magic uh grammar mm. the word grammar is actually related to the word glamour which is, uh, you know, glamour is, 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 if you look at the entomology, it's sort of related to, to magic. Um, hmm. Spell, spell, there's one for you. 
spell. We talk about casting a spell in magic. Though a wizard would cast a spell with his magic wand and spell, you spell a word, don't you, Mm. with the letters. So actually, words are sort of magic. They do have a magic power and a sort of a spirit to them. And so, yes, uh, repeating certain words as a mantra, as an affirmation, can actually Mm. have an effect. And if you just repeat the words like... I was thinking about this, um, words like um, uh, like share or speak or, or mm. energy or other words like that can actually somehow affirm certain feelings, maybe bring a bit more confidence, maybe make you a bit more willing to be fluent, a bit more willing to speak and, yeah. and express yourself. I mean, I, I, love, the word, uh, I love the word truth. And... I, I understand perfectly, and I've said this a million times on Life and Life Only, I don't know the truth. You know, I say this on the John Lennon thing as well. But occasionally you get little bits of truth. And as I was saying earlier with the meditation, like that, that thing with my dad, he, he suddenly, a truth came into his head. Oh, oh, you've got to forgive your father, you know, which is, which is, which is huge. Yeah. You know? But I love the word truth. So when I, when I was thinking of what, what can what can I have as a tagline for Life and Life Only, a search for inner and outer truth. Because, and words like real as well, you know, because yeah. so much of our, of our world is, is unreal or surreal or mm. could be slightly real. <laughs> yeah. So um, go back to that. Um, can I just continue your tangent for a second sure. on boxing? Yeah, yeah the boxing. Because I, I've, I've been fascinated by heavyweight boxing particularly and Muhammad Ali, I mean, he was just incredible it actually went from when i uh, i was having a very painful operation it was i was about seven years old and it was the first time i was ever separated from my family yeah the first time i ever knew like loneliness and my dad came to visit me in the hospital and he brought me a muhammad ali doll you know this thing you can sort of punch and then the head comes back and right like a little doll that you can punch yeah of muhammad yeah, ali yeah. yeah and uh then he showed me a load of muhammad ali videos but uh yeah. Uh, there's a good YouTube channel called Rummy's Corner. Have you ever come across? I mean, the guy's got a fantastic. I won't do his voice, but he's got his fantastic New York or New Jersey. I don't know what it is accent. And he does these dream fights, and he's just done a 20 minute video about Muhammad Ali and Mike Tyson. Yeah, because Muhammad Ali on his best night and Mike Tyson on his best night would be the best fight ever you could ever imagine. Mm. But uh, the only thing he didn't mention was that. Ali would probably win that fight because he'd be whispering in Tyson's ear the whole fight. And we know that Tyson was a bit mentally fragile yeah. due to his childhood. He would be, you know, there are certain words like, uh, I don't know, loser. You know, loser has got horrible yeah. negative connotation. Yeah. And I met this poor guy who said that his, when he was young, his father's nickname for him was useless. And really? I, I just thought, oh, you bastard. You That's a father. horrible nickname. <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible, isn't it? So, yeah, it can be good and bad. So, you know, where's a loser? You know, it's, it's got a horrible connotation to it yeah. and a sound, you know. Yeah. The point is, I guess, that words have an energy to them. And in meditation, mm. yeah, you, you can do affirmations. It's, yeah, Eric Harrison talks about affirmations in his book. Um, yes. You know, um, basically meditating on certain words uh, to affirm certain states of mind like um clarity and um calm and as you said let go which is yes. one of the ones that you do um how did you actually get into meditation then um well can you think of any band from the 60s who mm. ah, i can't think was it the monkeys was it herman's hermits <laughs> uh, no not surprisingly as i said earlier i i freely admit that about 80 percent of my life was governed by whatever the beatles had done yes it was through um discovering the beatles story and discovering uh i think the incredible thing i think i said this in the podcast i did in those days people didn't travel of course uh half as much you know, I mean, even even up to about the 80s, you know, most English people, the, the most extravagant thing they do was, was get a package holiday to Spain. Yes. Uh, which, be, which sort of became, it became very popular because they would basically recreate England in Spain. You know, it's one of those things where you hang around the hotel and you have a completely inauthentic experience just recreating your homeland. <laughs> they still anyway, do so it. Let me- but you're, you're talking about in the 60s at the time, around the time of the Beatles... Right, mm. just to be, just to make sure everyone's following this. Yes, that's like yes. you got into meditation because of the Beatles, and we're talking mm. about traveling because the Beatles traveled 
Uh, mm. And that's how they got into meditation. But yes, at the time, uh, traveling was a very rare thing for, for people to do. Yeah, they would go to Spain yeah. maybe and just recreate England, but with the sunshine. And they're still doing it today. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, but the Beatles traveled, uh, actually had traveling experiences beyond. Yeah, and I think of, of all the things they did, one of the ones which has really stood the test of time, of all, all the sort of things that have interested me about their story, is the idea of the journey from 1950s Liverpool. And I mean, I'm sure Liverpudlians wouldn't mind me saying this. Basically, everywhere everywhere outside London was pretty much disregarded by London, yeah. which London was the hub. It still is, but other cities have really made a name for themselves. But Liverpool was this place where people talked in these funny accents, you know, these much broader accents than you get now. And um, although there's this thing about John Lennon was actually middle class, he kind of was lower middle class, but they all came from, the Beatles are very earthy. Yeah. And and the distance from Liverpool and the relative lack of opportunities, you know, you're more or less heading for a factory unless you were a footballer or uh, an entertainer. Mm-hmm. The idea that then, they, in about 10 years, they would get from there to Rishikesh in India. And if you've seen those photos and there's bits of video, it's just it just looks magical. And I've been to India as well. I managed to get there in 2019. Yes. So it did come through the Beatles. But I feel like if, if it had only been because of the Beatles, I probably wouldn't have maintained an interest. So they were the spark. But then I think, like I was saying earlier with John Lennon, I think I've always been a bit like that in terms of chasing altered states or exploring my own consciousness and uh, i just wrote a story i won't i won't go through all the details mm. but i had this weird experience when i was about eight years old i was in the cubs yeah you know which people might know as the scouts but the cubs is like the pre-scouts isn't it's it something a, like that kind of a youth club <laughs> and, sort of youth club thing yeah kind of um and i, I was i was very short-sighted and i've since uh, i got glasses then contact lenses and then i got laser treatment um about 20 years ago anyway so in those days i was short-sighted which was another bond with john lennon because he was short-sighted and uh, i used to play football in a team and uh, i was a striker and one season i scored about 25 goals and the weird thing about it was that i was basically blind yeah and and there was this weird thing that was happening where i could kind of see like in front of me but it was i don't want to get too kind of lofty about this but i feel like there was almost a slightly mystical force you <laughs> know i remember once and i've actually got the match reports um, <laughs> and uh, i remember once i got the ball and i could see in the distance the goal and this little guy because everyone was about seven years old <laughs> this little guy who looked tiny guarding the goal and i just hit the ball and it went over his head and went into the goal and I'm honestly not. I'm, I'm honestly not saying this to to blow my own trumpet. Yeah. There's a good idiom, yeah. uh, but there was this, a weird kind of force. I don't know what it was. The force was the, with you, Anthony. The football the force. force the force you. of football. But then the really comedic thing is that for some reason my dad and I uh, decided that um, I should play in glasses and tape my glasses to my head. And the <laughs> one match where I could see, I was rubbish. <laughs> So then the next match, we said, oh, yeah, we ditched the glasses, and I scored, like, four goals or something. What the hell is uh, all that about? I know, I know. You're like the blind, so, no, no. Like the blind swordsman or something well, like well, that. Well, I, I turned it into a story that's going to be in this book that I'm hoping to write this year, yeah. this Glass Onion, based on the John Lennon podcast, and I called it the blind goal scorer, and I kind of reinvented myopia as a superpower. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a roundabout way of saying that I think I've always been interested in sort of consciousness and exploring myself, yeah, even from an early age. So I think that's where the interest. But the Beatles were the spark. Okay, because yeah. they went mm. to Rishikesh in India uh, mm. to do a meditation retreat with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Maharishi, <laughs> what have you done? And um, <laughs> yeah, so they had that experience, and they sort of got all cosmic, didn't they? Mm. Um, and spiritual, especially George Harrison, who I think really went for it. And so, yeah, meditation, they sort of, I mean, I, I guess they uh, were a great advert for meditation, weren't they, the Beatles? Because, you know, they, they talked about transcendental, transcendental meditation. They did it mm. and stuff like that. And I, I guess they uh, uh, allowed everyone to find out about it um, mm. a lot, including you. Um, 
Yeah, but um, you also went on meditation retreats, I believe, mm. right in Thailand. You've been on a you've been on a few meditation retreats. Mm. Can you tell us anything about them? Yeah, I'll have to give you the short version because there's so much to say. But I, I did put it in my uh, podcast, and I would like your listeners, if they're interested, to listen to the the two parter I did. Um, yeah, I went on. Uh, there were ten day retreats. They're called Vipassana, and Vipassana roughly translates as insight meditation. I think they've stopped because of COVID, but um, they were always on the first ten days of the month, and they're worldwide. I think. But the one in Thailand was very, very well organized. It didn't cost a lot of money. It, it wasn't like one of these sort of spa retreats where you just pay loads of money. And, you know, it's more more about relaxation, as you were saying. Um, I went twice, 2003 and 2010. 2003, I had a pretty bad lifestyle. I was uh, drinking, smoking weed, probably not eating the greatest food in the world, mm -hmm. partying a lot. Yeah. Um, so the first three days was was a, a hideous <laughs> withdrawal, but then it got easier. And then in 2010, I'd, uh, again, like John Lennon, I'd reinvented myself as a raw food exercise freak. <laughs> <laughs> my, life is, my life has followed John Lennon's in many ways, and I've gone from one extreme to another and followed a certain thing for a few months very intensely. Anyway, the second one was a much easier because I, I was in a very healthy state when I got there. Mm. And... Um, Oh, how can I sum this up? Yeah, the first few days are difficult because you are withdrawing, not just from things like, I don't know, whatever you're into, chocolate, cigarettes, uh, television, it's all that. That is taken away. I did sneak in, I had an exercise book and I was writing down my thoughts because I'm a long-term journaler, diarist. Right. I've done it pretty much you all my adult life. Write diaries. Um, yeah. yeah, so you, you would... Um, yeah, the day would start at four o'clock with a bell. Four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock in the morning, yeah. Um, you would go down, because it, cause you're in Thailand, there's no issues with the weather apart from occasional rain, but it's always sunny, it's always warm, so you don't have to worry. So you can wear, like, loose clothing. You wear very comfortable clothing. And uh, about, so you quickly, like, brush your teeth, and they had, this, they had these wells full of, uh, obviously, cold water. And you splash this cold water on your face, and it's such a lovely feeling, mm. you know. Yeah, you're a bit drowsy, a bit tired, but you get used to it. And then you go about 4.30, we'd go, and um, uh, there was a, a sort of a, I don't know, it was almost like it looked like a kind of bandstand area. I, I don't know how to describe it, but you'd all sit, and they do readings by candlelight. And um, me being me, of course, I volunteered to do a reading. Yeah. And you're reading these kind of spiritual texts, and at 4.30 in the morning in this lovely peaceful place it i can't tell you how just how lovely it was and then at five o'clock you do yoga which again is great you feel amazing at the end of it and then through the day it's a mixture of uh, meditations uh, sometimes you listen to the speakers doing readings and uh, the other thing about it oh yeah so i should mention a <laughs> 10 day silent retreat <laughs> except for those readings the rest of the time it's just silence you can't just sort of like oh all right morning how are you this morning yeah yeah no talking at all yeah silence no talking at all and then uh, you'd have a uh, breakfast about eight o'clock quite a big meal uh obviously all vegetarian generally curries soups salads that kind of thing and then you'd eat at midday and then you wouldn't eat until the next day and of course the general perception of that was um, that it's some sort of uh, torture you know <laughs> taking away all your pleasures and you know and they had books around and they tend to be sort of spiritual books not not holy texts but you know books of um, about meditation and things like that so it sounds like and it is quite painful to ask you earlier is it work and stuff is it painful yes it is for a few days but you wouldn't really do the retreat unless you were somewhat committed to going through the pain barrier to get some results. Um, so, yeah, and you find out very quickly that one of the hardest things in the world is to do do nothing or to sit silently and have all your, what I would call defence mechanisms, really. What you were saying earlier, the things we use to protect ourselves, I call them defence mechanisms, really that's all taken away um and it's tough but you get used to it and the feeling at the end of it is is quite amazing you know you come out on the 11th day <laughs> you feel you feel you've achieved something because you've done something that was very difficult 
And um, if I could just share one memory, this is um, this is something that in the West sounds like some horrible cliche, you know, same as sitting in the lotus position. <laughs> we used to do little uh, chores just to keep the meditation centre. It was things like sweeping. It wasn't like, you know, you weren't scrubbing floors on your hands and knees. It was <laughs> very simple stuff, sweeping and things like that. Yeah. And one of the things I took to doing was, um, there's obviously a lot of insects in uh, in Asia, and one of the things of like looking closely, I took to just looking at the ants and looking at what they were doing. And there's a few podcasts about ants. You know, if, if anyone's interested, they are just <laughs> yeah. remarkable creatures. Yeah, they, they can are. build, a, they can create a bridge <laughs> by working together. It's it makes a bridge out of you themselves. Know, a bridge out of themselves, yeah, exactly. They're not building a bridge from materials. They are the bridge. Yeah. It's absolutely astonishing. Yeah, they are incredible, yeah. They are, yeah. And um, just following insects and just looking closer, that was really all it was. You know, I would just try and look closely at things and not not just be always busy and always in a busy state and task-oriented. Because on those 10 days, you've got you've got nothing really to achieve. You know, you've got... You've not really got an end result. You could give yourself an end result, but it's probably better not to, because you're you're going to feel amazing when you, once you've got through those ten days anyway. So you don't need to be sort of saying, "Oh, by the fourth day, I want to be feeling a bit better, or I want to be, you know, B one level meditator," <laughs> as we said earlier. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I would probably say perhaps that if someone has never done it before, perhaps go for a three day or a five day because it's a bit heavy if you've never done it, and particularly if you've got a quite an unhealthy lifestyle you're going to have a, a fairly nasty detox <laughs> yeah it's going to be quite a a contrast mm. between if you do sort of like i don't know what should we call it self-medicate or whatever uh mm. with uh even just you know having a couple of glasses of wine in the evening to help you relax as people say um mm. or, or or if you smoke cigarettes because i suppose smoking cigarettes was not allowed uh at the retreat no. yeah so all those things coffee as well no coffee no caffeine all those mm. things that we that essentially become habits, yeah. That when you take all of those things away in one go, uh, your body can sort of react and it's like, ah, what's happening? What are you doing? Yeah, it's a yeah. pretty strong detox. Um, yeah, there's a story on the podcast. I won't repeat it now, but it was to do with the fact that we hadn't had any caffeine or sugar for ten days, and then we went to get a coffee and a cake. And uh, there's a picture. I, I, I'll send it to you at some point of me with bug eyes. Because I suddenly realised this is part of the outer truth. This is part of the outer truth thing about um, most people are addicted to caffeine or sugar or usually both. Yeah. And I suddenly realised, talking about truth, suddenly realised how awesomely powerful caffeine and sugar were because I'd sort of flushed them out my system or I hadn't had them for 10 days and then had an injection of refined sugar. You know, there's a difference between simple sugar and refined sugar yeah. although maybe everything's refined now maybe there isn't any difference yeah, anymore yeah. but uh yeah the, these are awesome that, that so there's a truth that essentially everyone is a drug addict they just have different drugs right right uh, and some are illegal some some are legal some are illegal some are socially acceptable some are not but you know there there was a little truth that came out of day 11 of the retreat you know when i was on my way out of the retreat back into uh civilized life yeah we're all <laughs> we're all sort of like drugged up to some extent yes. on something yeah just yes. to get through the day almost um yes. yeah so when you had coffee and cake after your 10 days of sort of abstinence yeah you got mm. bug eyes so your eyes kind of popped out of your head and <laughs> yeah almost yeah when you see the pic I, you've never seen the picture of no. you. I'll, I'll have to send it i'll send it to you after we finish this okay. recording but uh it's yeah it's quite astonishing so after and also i was i was also i rang up my girlfriend at the time and, and apparently i was just sort of, sort of babbling to her about <laughs> just like <laughs> blah, 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 millions of words all at the same time yeah all the i guess kind of got this horrible this rush of uh and it was pretty nasty really because you know if you do it's interesting if you do take away things like um, all these social acceptable drugs alcohol caffeine sugar just see what the effect is and then you re kind of realize what they're doing to you you know yeah they're pretty nasty things really yeah mm. and they sort of mm. yeah it's, it's poisons of, they're poison yeah yeah you know there was a book in in the 1970s called something like sweet poison or something about refined sugar because yeah. that's really what it is to be honest yeah anyway um <laughs> right now 
we can't go on forever and ever, but there's, you know, there's a lot more that we wanted to talk about. A lot more of, to be honest, which is covered in those two episodes of your podcast, uh, which mm. people must uh, go and listen to. But I think just as, just near the end here, should we at least talk a bit more about Eric Harrison's book, mm. uh, Teach Yourself to Meditate, which uh, should be available from any decent bookshop. Um, mm. How did you get a copy of this book? Uh, yes, I was in... Um Oh, what's the name of that shop in England that sells books at absurdly low prices and no one's quite sure how they stay in business? Um, what's it called? Oh, is it The Works? The Works? The Works. Yeah, I'm not sure. sure there's I, a don't bookshop. I don't know, actually. Sure there's a bookshop I was thinking of the Oxfam, Works. the Oxfam bookshop, but um, that's a different kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, there's that one as well. I think it was The Works, yeah. I was in... Um, I had a friend who lived in Brighton and we decided to to meet in red hill which is equidistant it's not a very interesting story but <laughs> we, so we just met in this random town and we went to we went for lunch or whatever and then i was in this works bookshop and um i've kind of been thinking uh, I, I really would like to get back into meditation and i just spotted this book called teach yourself to meditate as you said by eric harrison and uh i kind of thought oh god i've read so many meditation books you know it's going to be the usual thing but as I, as you normally do, I picked it up and read a few lines, and every single thing I read had some like piece of gold, you know. This this great, it's the way it's written, the way he said. I thought, ah, oh, what the hell? I'll, I'll buy it, and it was some absurdly low price of two pounds. And uh, the the funny <laughs> the funny part of the story, I think I said this in the podcast, yeah. was that also on sale was uh, Jordan's. Katie Price's second autobiography. Yeah, so listeners, you not her first one, a second one, a second one because she's got about five. <laughs> <laughs> listeners, you might not know who Jordan is if you're not, you know, mm. familiar with like UK culture and just uh, if you haven't seen all the newspapers and stuff. Um, so J- Jordan is a sort of a what's known as a glamour model, I guess, or a reality TV star. Uh, or, or a car crash or a car what? crash yes i mean yeah. like he, you know not literally a car crash but she's no. she's just like a celebrity who's famous for nothing um she mm. did sort of sexy photographs of herself in all the lads magazines back in the mm. back in the 90s and then she became a, a reality tv star she's a bit like a very very low budget kardashian sort of thing Paris Hilton maybe a bit yeah like that. but like even like very very I don't want to be mean and nasty it's just not fair mm. it's not right but it's you know it's just <laughs> like the, the the tabloid newspapers love her they love printing stories about her and um she's fa- she's kind of famous for not really doing anything I don't know why she's famous really but she's um yeah yeah she's she's tabloid newspaper fodder basically Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, she, you know, I don't know if I met her, she's probably a perfectly reasonable person, I suppose. I don't know, but it's just like yeah. her place in the, in the popular consciousness is, is that, and, uh, she's, she's done very well for herself in some ways. Like, as you say, mm. she's written not just one book about her life, mm. one autobiography An autobiography is like the story of someone's life written by them. Mm. She's written about five volumes <laughs> of this autobiography so yeah there was a there was a one of those copies in the shop and it was it was on sale for how much well that's the thing this is this is the reason i mention it it just tells you something about our society and our culture that this meditation book was a was i think 199 or something ridiculous and it's and there's so much in it it's a it's a it's a book that can transform your life and then hers is a, a probably 12.99 or something yeah and you know, it's not to diss her. I'm sure if you're interested in her, you'd get a lot out of it. It just t- it just tells you something about our culture, but we can benefit from it because we can get the we can get the transformative book for one ninety nine that nobody else is interested yeah. in. So. Yeah, so good, I guess. Um, all right, so yeah, the the book sort of like really spoke to you when you picked it up, and then um, mm. I mean, I guess like your dad did, because as you said before, you you just read it from cover to cover like a book rather than using it as a as a manual. Is that what you did first? Uh, I can't remember. I th- no, I think I did some of the meditations, but I didn't do all of them. I did, yeah, I kind of read it like a book, I suppose. But um, the thing about it, they have these things called spot meditations. And, I mean, they take 30 seconds. You can do them in the car. Yeah. Uh, probably n- not while you're driving, I should say, at traffic lights and things like that. They're so simple that, really, there's no excuse for saying, oh, oh I don't have time to do this. 
you know and i think i said on my podcast you know the example would be well you know a working mother with three noisy young children or something but i i've known working mothers at meditation groups who do meditation so yeah yeah you know can't really use that excuse but it's so well written and yeah it because it's 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 almost like a psychology book as well in a way um Another book like that, I mean, I read uh, the Alan Carr's Easy Way to Stop Smoking. Mm. And anyone who wants to stop smoking, I can't recommend that book enough. Because it has a similarity in this, is that almost everything he says just seems to make perfect sense. And that's a psychology book as well. So this book is a kind of like it because it has amazing insights into, into how most people's minds work uh, in terms of, as you said, living in our culture. Obviously, everybody's different, but... You know, everyone knows about the thing where, you know, thoughts just keep popping into your head and you wish you could get rid of them and, you know, they start to annoy you or they start to, you know, make your mind kind of foggy. Or, or just so, being, or just dealing with stress, just being sort of the, yeah. the, the object of stress and just stress attacking you. You, you mentioned spot mm. meditations and the mm. things that you can even do while you're driving. I mean, there is one, the first spot meditation in the book is called Red Light and it's it's not designed mm. for you to like pick up the book while you're in the car, but it's just one that mm. you can remember and do when you are in the car and you stop at a red light. So, I mean, you know, I drive in Paris sometimes and it's incredibly stressful. It's like really like life-threateningly stressful. Driving is a very stressful thing. But the red light meditation, I mean, I can do it now. It's only a few lines mm. if I can read it out because I know a lot of people listening to this podcast do listen to it in the car. Uh, so, um, so this is a spot meditation from page 15 of Teach Yourself to Meditate by Eric okay. Harrison. And I'm just going to read it out now. So uh, it's called Red Light, and it goes like this. So this exercise works best if you are late, in a hurry, and the traffic lights turn red just as you approach. So here are the instructions. If you feel frustrated, smile at yourself. You've been given perhaps a whole minute to stop and do nothing. Let body and mind slow down and relax. Take a deep sigh, lingering on the out-breath. Let your face and belly soften. One whole minute to breathe softly. Be aware of excess tension in your body. Gently shake it free as you settle back into the seat. Look around you slowly. The exercise finishes as the light turns green. Now devote all your attention to the task at hand, driving safely and well. And look forward to the next red light. Yeah, very good. Very simple. Yeah, yeah, very simple. And just so, so well written as well. And just that very first thing you said. What was the first thing you said? If you feel frustrated, smile at yourself. I mean, that's great. You know, try and... I think one of the things with anything in life is to try and laugh at yourself. And you... You know, I've read plenty of history books of people in terrible situations. You know, obviously the ultimate one from the middle of the 20th century where they were able to smile. So, you know... Yeah. I I think one of the things with meditation is try to enjoy it, you know, and, and... what a great start, you know, laugh at yourself, you know, smile at yourself. Yeah. Think, think, oh, I'm here. Yeah, if you're in your car, like you were saying, think, oh, I'm just in this silly mechanical box and everyone's screaming at each other, you know. Yeah. Try and see the funny side. I do actually do try and, I always try and do that when I'm on the metro, on the Paris metro. It can be, mm. you know, like most of those uh, public transport systems in the big cities, they can be incredibly st- uh, crowded and stressful mm. and I, f- I sometimes I'll be in the middle of a crowded metro train and I'll look around and everyone looks so stressed out and miserable mm. and at those yeah. moments I think ah, don't be one of those people just have a little just laugh at this this is ridiculous and it really yeah. helps it does actually help and I sort of think I always think to myself I must never become one of those miserable stressed out people I'm, I yeah. must always have a smile uh, and it it does help. I really do think it helps improve your life. Um, you know. Um, well, could I just say one thing? Yeah. Uh, two days ago, we did a podcast about Monty Python and the Holy Grail, didn't we? We did for for Film Goal, but that will appear in your feed, I imagine, eventually. At some point, so, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So uh, 
you know, watch a bit of Monty Python and just <laughs> laugh at the utter absurdity of life. Because most of life is absurd. So yeah. <laughs> having a sense of humour about it will definitely help, yeah. you know? Like watch the, watch the fish slapping dance on YouTube or something. <laughs> yes. Which is yeah. basically two soldiers doing some sort of um, uh, military exercise involving yeah. slapping fish, uh, slapping each other's faces with fish. And yeah. it's, <laughs> it's wonderful. With a great with a great slapstick ending as well. Um, yeah. Do you want to read any any uh, sections from the book out? Um, I know you did. Well, you d- it just so happens. Yeah, um, <laughs> you did a lot of that in your episode, and again, I'll recommend that people go and listen to that. But we can do a little bit here as well because mm. I, I think that we should allow people to enjoy the uh, the writing and some of the wisdom mm. and some of the uh, some other uh, little meditation exercises too. So absolutely. So if you want to follow this, uh, page 34 and 35, yeah. if anyone's actually got the book, of course it would be lovely if they'd bought the book um, and then stop the episode and then <laughs> listen to the rest of it with the book. Like stop the episode, go get a car, drive into town, do the red light meditation on the way, go to the yeah. bookshop. Uh, excuse me, do you have Teach Yourself to Meditate by Eric Harrison? Uh, sorry, we don't. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Life is absurd. Yeah. I'll just go home and carry on listening. Yeah, yeah. Get get in your car, have a horrible experience in traffic, <laughs> and then come back, and we'll make you feel better. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> okay, this is called random object. I'm going to use my calm voice here. This technique can be practiced during any free moment. For example, sitting at your desk, or waiting at a bus stop, or in your car. Instructions: Pick out an interesting object in your field of vision. It could be an acacia flower, the grass swaying in the wind, a pattern on someone's shirt. Settle your mind there, drop the inner talk, shift into sensing. Let your eyes soften a little, but don't stare. Use your eyes like a zoom lens. Let time slow down and explore the object at your leisure. Imagine its texture or smell, if appropriate. Allow associations to arise. Let your body soften and relax. Take a deep breath and sigh as you breathe out. Be aware of the object, your body, and the stream of attention linking them. Finally, let the object go, consciously. Check how your mind, check how your mind state has changed. Are you more calm and aware? Very nice. Mm. Mm. Some of the things I wanted to read from the book were the sections on why people meditate, uh, mm. which is quite good uh, commentary, and Eric Harrison is very articulate and clear about it. Um, so let me just read uh, maybe a couple of things from pages 18 to 24. The chapter is called Why Do People Meditate? And he lists a few different reasons, for example, for relaxation, for health, for inner peace and harmony, for concentration, to improve performance, for inspiration and vision, for quality of life, uh, for self-awareness and therapy, and uh, for spiritual awakening, even. And mm. so, so I just want to pick out some of these things. So health is obviously a good one, because, um, mm. you know, this is like, you know, the most important thing, isn't it, probably? Um, so let me just read out, oh, there's a couple of pages. I'll see what I can do. So okay. uh, health, page 19. Just to be more relaxed each day is enormously valuable for our health. Meditation takes us one step further. Hundreds of medical surveys support the contention that meditation is good for health. These are the most common findings. Meditation releases muscular tension. This automatically relieves pain, increases mobility and lets the body relax. The breath, the body fluids and the nerve impulses can flow more freely. Meditation lowers high blood pressure. The release in muscular tension makes the body more pliable. The heart doesn't have to pump as hard to force the blood through the veins and arteries. When stressed, our blood becomes thick with cholesterol. This thins out when we relax. Meditation stimulates the immune system and the production of white blood cells. The immune system winds down when the body is stressed. The healing process works best when the body is relaxed or sleeping. Meditation speeds recovery rates after illness or surgery. And meditation opens constricted air passages. It is particularly good for asthmatics or hay fever sufferers. And 
he goes on, you know, talking about things like the fact that meditation increases blood circulation to the digestive tract, to the skin and to the brain, that it dramatically mm -hmm. affects hormonal activity, that it balances left and right hemisphere activity in the brain. I mean, it's not like, um, a, you know, he does point out at some point that it's not like a, um, a cure-all. It's not obviously going to cure some of the major diseases and stuff. But, um, mm. you know, it's just a good way of promoting general, uh, general good health, both physically and mentally. Um, some other things that could relate to language learning, one of them is concentration. This is what he says about that in the book. Um, so he says, uh, stress undermines our ability to concentrate. If we try to think and do a dozen different things at once, we do none of them well. Meditation trains us to focus on one thing at a time. We become skilled at discarding the mental trivia and unproductive obsessions. This gives space for us to work so we can bring all of the mind to the task at hand. And um, to improve performance, I'll read this one too. Um, in the United States of America, many meditation teachers earn their living training sports people and stage performers. Such people realize meditation gives them the edge that they need for peak performance. They know that operating solely at high adrenaline levels is counterproductive. Great dancers, tennis players and actors have a grace and ease in performance. They are relaxed. They use just the right amount of energy for the task at hand. A hockey player told me, Meditation is wonderful for me. We lost the grand final, but I played my best game of the season. I always had plenty of time to get where I was going. I could rest in the pauses. I felt the surges of energy going where they needed to go in the body. Maybe those things relate to language learning to an extent, you know, in the sense that you need sure. concentration. It's a sort of a performance. Everyone's had that feeling where they just can't sort of get the words out. It is a physical mm. thing, speaking a language, getting your mouth around the words and all that sort of thing. It seems yeah. to apply, I would say. There's a bit there about inspiration and vision. And again, just those two words. I mean, the inspiration particularly. It's one of those words with a fantastic energy. But those health benefits, I mean, it's quite quite amazing. Obviously, taking him at his word. and um, Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's quite amazing because it, cause that becomes far more than just relaxing. And when you were talking about uh, it doesn't cure diseases, you're right. However, um, doctors are finally getting round to being open to the idea that stress can create, uh, I don't know about create disease, but can uh, contribute quite significantly to serious diseases. So if meditation can profoundly uh, reduce your stress levels, then, you know, we don't want to make lofty claims. And he, he, he kind of says this in the book, doesn't he? Yeah. You don't want to say, I'll just meditate and you're, you, you won't get cancer or something. But uh, in a roundabout way, you know, with one thing leading to another, it, it really can have profound changes. I think yeah, if it, I'd rather just say that. Just, you know, yeah. we know that blood pressure is a contributor to things like uh, heart disease and Absolutely. cholesterol and those sorts of things. It's just like holistic health, isn't it? Just general overall health and just having a sort of a foundation of, uh, you know, good general health, I suppose, which, is, mm. uh, which can contribute to preventing, you know, uh, these sorts of things. You know, it's like, you know, mm. uh, having the right diet or doing enough exercise, <clears throat> you know, all those yeah. things are important, just daily things to promote overall good health. I, I was thinking as well that there's a, a book, uh, you probably noticed there's loads and loads of podcasts that are book review ones, and some, some of them are really good. Mm. And um, I discovered a book called Flow, uh, which I haven't, I haven't read, I'm ashamed to say, but it's on my list. I've got such a long list. Yeah. And uh, the flow state is 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 very similar to a meditative state. So, you know, a marathon runner, so a long distance runner would would know about that. You know, they are they are kind of meditating. I think I think it's a good thing if we broaden the definition of meditation out. You know, to quite a few areas. I think that's helpful. It's also called mindfulness, isn't it? Mindfulness, yeah. which uh, you know, you mentioned this to me before we started recording. That mindfulness is a word 
that is used, let's say, in the West or in the English-speaking world to refer to basically meditation. It's essentially the same thing. And, yeah. you know, you, you could just Google mindfulness and language learning, and there's quite a lot of that. People talk about noticing in language learning, which is a sort of a general term for being aware and mindful of language as you, as you consume it. Um, mm. And, uh, yeah, so all those things sort of all contribute. Uh, we could We could do more i mean do you want is there are there any other uh, passages you'd like to read out now um before the end yes just maybe just one more yeah. uh, the music meditation okay this is sort of close to my heart um yeah this is anyone who's got the book and for you 76 and 77 i've become in the last few years i've started to cultivate an interest in jazz and jazz is a bit like classical music and I, I know it in a very sort of generic sense without being be able to identify certain people but i become a fan of john coltrane who uh started off as a probably more conventional jazz player but uh through certain experiences he had in the 60s uh, hmm. developed this thing that you might call psychedelic jazz so i'd recommend uh maybe one of his pieces for this but you can use anything but this is um a meditation related to music so all right let's go for this if music is your meditation object, the usual instructions apply. Relax, focus on the music, and when the mind wanders away, bring it back. People often ask, is any music best for meditation? Any non-vocal music you like will do. It can be fast, slow, tranquil, or passionate. It should have a certain edge to it for the mind to grasp hold of. I often meditate to fast, complex music. However, the quality of your focus is more important than the music itself. New age or relaxation music is often too insubstantial to meditate on. It can be designed to make the mind dreamy rather than focused. However, even this can be useful to create an ambience while you meditate on something else. So the instructions. Scan your posture and breathing for a minute or two. Get your mind into alpha before the music starts. Alpha is a more of a relaxed state. Uh, if you compare it to beta, which is the quote-unquote busy state that I'd say most of us probably live our lives in. Mm. Switch on the music and enjoy it. Feel the detail and colour. If images or colours spontaneously arise, you can use them to deepen the meditation. Feel the music resonate within your body. Ask yourself occasionally, am I still with the music? Notice when you are drifting away. Notice the special live quality of those moments when you are completely with the music. When the music stops, come back to yourself. Did you relax fully or are you a little charged up? Are you holding your breath or is it soft and loose? When you feel fully in touch with yourself, come out of the meditation. That's Very it. nice. Mm. <clears throat> I do want to do some more. Um, another spot <laughs> meditation. I, I, well, actually, what I'll say is this. Um, again, bringing it back to uh, learning English with meditation. Um, here's just a tip. Uh, what people could do is maybe before they've got to use english like maybe if they've got a meeting in english or if they have a job interview in english or if it's an english lesson or any other situation in which they're going to be using english beforehand um or even if it's like english practice like just doing some listening or reading or speaking or active study from a book or reflection strategies or revision or testing yourself pronunciation work like repeating or shadowing but whenever you are about to enter the english zone as it were then you could do a quick meditation first just to kind of clear your mind and help you to focus um, i quite like the meditation he the, the spot meditation uh, called freeze which is on page 42 okay. this is a nice one i think it's about um so Freeze. It's about stress and about sort of noticing when you're stressed and then sort of um, getting rid of stress before you have to do something. So this is on page 42, spot meditation, freeze. It's easy to crank up the tension during the day, but we rarely give ourselves time to relax. This meditation is designed to wind us down just a little, to strip off the top 20% of tension. We don't need to function on peak adrenaline all day. Occasional moments of rest can make us more efficient overall. Instructions. Tell yourself to freeze. Hold your posture, but not your breath. 
You may be at your desk, doing the dishes, or standing in a queue. Scan your body slowly up and down, observing areas of excess tension. Don't change anything yet. Notice how you are breathing. When you feel in tune with yourself, say defrost. Allow tension to release. Make little adjustments wherever possible. Sit or stand straighter. Loosen your shoulders or your neck or your eyes, your stomach or your hands. And don't stop. Be systematic about it. Loosen each part of your body and enjoy making finer and finer adjustments. Take a deep breath and sigh as you breathe out. Feel yourself breathing. Can you give the breath more space and freedom? Notice how much your mood is changing and then resume your former activity when ready, retaining an awareness of the body. So that could be just a way to, you know, get rid of stress and maybe get yourself in the right kind of physical and mental space to Mm. do whatever you're doing more efficiently and effectively, like, you know, practicing your English. Um, So there we go. I mean, there's loads more. There are, there are loads of other yeah. things that we both want to read out from that book. But <laughs> as I've said a number of times, and I'll say it again, listeners, do listen to Anthony's original two episodes, episodes four and five of Life and Life Only. You can get them wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find links in the description to this one and on the page for this episode on my website. Anthony, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me and my listeners all about this. It's been really interesting. You're very welcome, yeah. yeah. And there's lots of things that come up during the conversation that I didn't even think I was going to be talking about. So, yeah, it's been good. You're like punching a doll of Muhammad Ali when you were in hospital, <laughs> for example. Yeah, or telling the audience that I've wasted about 20 years of my life. <laughs> Just uh, little things like that. Oh, I'm sure you didn't really waste 20 years of your life. Maybe 19, <laughs> 18, maybe. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. well, look, have a, have a nice day and uh, yeah, speak to you soon in some format. Looking forward to listening to more episodes of your podcasts when they come out. Yeah, at some point, both of our audiences will hear this episode and then the one we did about Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So, uh, trying to find, trying to desperately find a link. <laughs> the world, the world is mad. <laughs> the world and is we're, mad. And we're, we're all quite mad as well. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so you've got to, what can you do? Just slow down, stop, and try to enjoy yeah. it, I suppose. Meditate and watch comedy. There you go. Sorted. So there you go. That was my conversation with Anthony about meditation. That was a long one. Did you make it all the way through? Did you make it this far? I wonder. Uh, let me know. I've got to, I'm, I'm going to have to think of some kind of code word again, aren't I, to uh, sort of um, find out who's been actually listening all the way to the end. What will the code word be? I've no idea. Um, I don't have much more to say at the end here, except I'd like to ask you to consider writing your comments in the comments section. Um, what are your thoughts? What are your reflections on the idea of uh, meditation and the benefits of it? And would you consider doing it? Um, and would you like to know more? Uh, you know, there you go. Let, let us know your thoughts about meditation. So there you go. That's, that's pretty much all. Um, I'm sitting here in our uh, untidy uh, flat, which is still um, slowly but surely being sorted out. But um, uh, they are doing work upstairs. I was wondering if the A-team would start making loads of noise. I don't know why. It's like a a, a recurring theme on this podcast, isn't it? Me being uh, bothered by the noise of people drilling. It's just been a constant thing for years. It's either people drilling or it's my washing machine whirring or it's a postman, the doorbell going and I have to rush off. So they are working upstairs, but I think what's happened now is that they have literally smashed every single wall to pieces, and there are, there's just, there are no walls left for them to smash. So they're just up there, just like looking around, just looking at each other, going, well, what are we going to do now? I suppose we have to build an apartment here, um, because they did a lot of smashing and drilling, and then a bit more smashing. So there you go. It's been a smashing episode. Ah, there you go. There's the, there's the code word, smashing. Now, smashing, obviously, we're talking about smashing walls down with big hammers. 
upstairs. But smashing can also mean fantastic or great. So you could write, that was a smashing episode. See if you can get the word smashing into your comment. Okay, I had a smashing time listening to your smashing episode. The conversation was just smashing, especially the bit at the end. I hope that uh, the people above you have stopped smashing walls down. You know, whatever you want, but try and get the word smash or smashing in there. Good luck. Okay, thanks so much for listening. Don't forget, if you want those one-to-one lessons with a British Council-approved tutor online from the comfort of your own home, then you could check out British Council English School Tutors. They'll give you a a trial lesson for $1. And if you choose to buy a pack of lessons, they'll give you a a lesson free, which is nice. Get some speaking, regular speaking into your life. It's very important for improving your fluency, your pronunciation, and your general confidence. Okay? Uh, To get the offer, just go to... uh, What is it? teacherluke.co.uk slash English. Okay? All right. Nice one. Thank you so much for listening. I will speak to you again soon. I think that I didn't say this earlier. I think probably the next few uploads that I'm going to do uh, will be um, premium episodes because they're overdue. And I've been working on still working on P33 part three, 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 three. Um, it's become an absolute monster. And P P33 might end up being 10 episodes long at this rate. But anyway, premium stuff is coming. I've been saying that for, for ages, but it's, it's still true. So probably the next uploads will be premium stuff before I get back to the normal podcast. My pod room, um, I installed a desk. Oh, it was incredibly satisfying. I installed a desk in my podcasting room. Um, and oh, it was a long process trying to buy secondhand desks. And uh, I, I thought that I'd got one. I thought I was on this website that you can do in Paris called Le Bon Coin, the the good corner. And it's a place where you can buy secondhand stuff. So I was hunting on that website for um, for a good desk. And I thought I got one in a, in an office just around the corner from from my, my office, right? So it was only a few doors away, in fact. And there it was, the perfect desk. And I, you know, reserved it online, went down to pick it up. I was very excited to be able to finally get a desk. And uh, the girl let me into the office and she was like, oh, oh, it's, it's not here. Oh, oh no, someone must have sold it already. So I was like, why you... Um, and she she immediately became incredibly apologetic and re- obviously full of remorse. She felt really bad. She was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm the worst, she said in English. I'm the worst. I'm the worst. And she said, maybe there's something else you can take. And she said, what about that desk? And I was like, no, too long. What about that desk? No, too short. And she was like, oh, I'm really sorry about this. Why don't you take a chair, she said. And I was like, hmm, looked around couple of office chairs, you know, those generic black office chairs that are designed in a certain way and they've got a little lever underneath so you can go up and down and they spin round. Those ones, generic office chairs. There were two there. She pointed at one and and it looked all right, but the seat was all crusted. It's like it got wet and it was stained with something. And I was like, hmm. And then she said, or this one. And she pointed to one which was a bit better and much cleaner. And I was like, actually, I thought to myself, I do need a chair. So I thought, so I said, okay, all right. I kind of tried not to be too excited about it because I thought this is brilliant because I, I needed a chair too. So if she's just going to give me one, this is perfect. But I, w- I tried not to be too excited. Like, yippee, a free chair. Instead, I was like, hmm, um, okay, I suppose so. Yeah, that, yeah, that might be useful. And so she just let me leave with this chair and wheeled it down the street. She was very awkward. She she was, uh, I think, very apologetic. And she, I don't know if you've ever had this, but when you just have an awkward meeting with a stranger and then when it's finished, what you want to do is just walk off in the opposite direction from that person. You don't want to end up, oh, this is awkward. Oh, well, now we're walking down the street together. I, I, we'd already said goodbye. Oh, God. You know, you don't want that. You want to just go in the opposite direction, even if it means going around, you know, the longer route or something. And so we got outside the building. I had my chair. It was pretty embarrassing. I was just there in the street, the busy streets of Paris with this big chair. And she was like, oh, OK, bye. And she disappeared as quickly as she could. And um, I realized that I needed to go that direction as well. But I let her go for a while. And then I started pushing the chair. And then I saw her coming back on the other side of the road. So I crossed over with my chair. And she 
had awkwardly had to do a 180 degree turn and but had crossed the road to avoid me but there I was on the other side of the road on her side pushing this chair she had to squeeze around me and she did that thing this is human nature isn't it when you see someone in the street when you walk past them and you know them but you don't they're not like your friend you're not going to stop and talk to them so there's that dilemma do i acknowledge the other person's presence like oh hi or do you just ignore them pretend you haven't seen them now i would bet that 75 percent of the time most human beings do the second one and they like just oh look at my phone and you know they they um just walk, keep walking, especially if it's a situation like this where she just clearly never wanted to speak to me again in her whole life. And so she just took off in the wrong direction. And then I crossed over the road with my chair and then she came back on my side of the road. And it was a very awkward moment where we walked past each other and she just pretended she hasn't she hadn't seen me. And I just thought to myself, that's so ridiculous because here I am with this huge chair she had to, that she's just given to me. And she's like, oh, I'm just walking around down the street. Oh, I don't, I'm not looking at anything. Uh, that was awkward. But I do have a chair and it goes up and down and spins round. That's not bad. And a desk, right? So she didn't, she didn't get me the desk. So I was like, right, plan B, I'll make a desk. Dun, dun, dun. So I went down to, of course, Leroy Merlin, that wonderful shop. By the way, Castorama is also available. Uh, other shops are available. Anyway, Leroy Merlin went down there, and uh, this is the longest episode ever. Okay. And I bought myself a, a tabletop. Okay. Uh, oak. 160, 160 centimeters long by 80 centimeters wide and 22 centimeters thick. A big tabletop of oak not too expensive actually i went for the oiled oak so it's kind of got a nice rich finish and um it was an epic day i had to take it i managed to get it on a bus i was wondering if the bus driver would let me on with this huge plank of wood but he let me on and you know basically i bought some legs for it and i bought a bracket this is exciting isn't it and I have amazed myself. I actually managed to attach part of the desk to the wall with a bracket and then two metal legs. And it's all at the right height. It's level. So I have a fitted desk and it's solid as well. It's solid as a rock. It's not like the desk I used to have in my previous place, which was like really wobbly. And so the desk would wobble. My laptop on top of it would wobble. And the camera on top of that would wobble even further. And it just looked like I was podcasting in an earthquake. But hopefully Hopefully that will not be the case anymore. So I actually have a solid fitted desk in there. No electricity still. I mean, it's just, I thought electricity moved quickly, right? I thought that was the point, but no, no, it doesn't. Not around here, apparently. So um, just ridiculous stuff. I've told you enough, probably. But it's just, it takes, it's like one guy comes, he has a look. Yeah, okay. And then a week later, the work starts to get done. He doesn't finish it. So he finishes it the week after that. And then a week after that, he comes back to get my signature. And then a week after that, someone else is going to have to visit the flat to confirm his work. And then they can switch it on. So I'm somewhere in the middle of that process. Why does it take a week for every single step? Surely that could be done in just a day or two, but no. So anyway, that's, you know, where I am. I'm not in this in the um, in my pod room. But I'm decorating it. Guitars are on the walls. I'm putting pictures up on the walls. So as soon as I get electricity, I am in. And, you know, we'll finally get started again properly. But as it is, I'm sitting here in my living room in the middle of a construction site. Because the building opposite us is also drilling. It's just, I live in a drilling area, a drilling place. Thanks for listening to this episode, everybody. I do hope that you got something from it. I hope you had a smashing time. I will speak to you again soon. Um, And if you want to get premium stuff, it's teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info. Okay, if you want to get the premium content. Uh, All the details are on my website. Thank you so much for listening. I will speak to you again soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.